Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the debut episode of The Putback on SNY.TV. I'm Ian Begley, here with my buddy Maurice Peebles, digital editor-in-chief at SNY. Thanks, Ian. Uh, What a great time for us to have our first episode, right? Let's kick it off with the baseline. The Knicks have agreed to terms with Thomas Thibodeau Jr. We expect the deal to be for five years. You had long said that he was the favorite for this job. Was there ever any doubt that Tibbs would be the next Knicks coach? Only a little bit at the end. A lot of people around the league expected it to be done about a week before it actually got done. You know, there was so much speculation about what was going on. The Knicks hadn't started negotiating with anyone as of early Thursday morning, and I think later Thursday, they got closer to a deal with Thibodeau. They got it done Saturday, and uh, it is who we all thought it was going to be. And now you have Leon Rose, you have William Worldwide West Wesley, and you have Tom Thibodeau, the team that is going to lead this Nick franchise moving forward. This week's guest is one of the most well-connected people in the NBA, ESPN senior writer, Zach Lowe, and host of the Low Post podcast. All the belly aching about minutes and his personality and all that, and like, those are all fair questions. Like, the guy knows how to win games when he has talent, which to me, like, the more interesting question now is what this means for the Knicks offseason, because they have a bunch of cap room. Hiring Tibbs would appear to telegraph, like, let's, let's hit the ground running, let's sign some veterans. Kind of did that last year kind of didn't work. Um, Five-year deal, if that's what it ends up being, maybe Telegraph's like, no, long runway, we can be patient. We trust Tibbs as an actual player development guy with young guys, but Tibbs can coach. You give Tibbs talent, you're going to punch above your weight. The best approach for the Knicks is what we saw in Brooklyn (gasps) over the last couple of years. You want to attract free agents, show them that you are on the precipice of competing. Show that free agent that that player is the missing piece to you contending. Is there anything that the organization in reality has to fear uh, about Tibbs' reputation? I've talked to players over the years that uh, would not be excited to play for Tom. But if you read, you know, John Krasinski at The Athletic, who was around the Timberwolves all the time, Tibbs actually, like, all of that noise didn't really come to fruition. Like, they practiced about, like, a normal amount of time. They didn't practice when most NBA teams don't practice, after back-to-backs, all that. All of that stuff, I think, softened a lot in Minnesota. From my perspective with the Knicks, one thing that they have lacked was a good synthesis between the front office and the coaching staff. Here, it's a bit different because of the relationship between Rose and Thibodeau. That's super important. You can't get anywhere as a team if everyone's you know, disagreeing with each other and the knives are out inside the organization. However, I feel like you and I have now done this podcast like six times in the past 10 years. <laughs> One thing has remained the same, and that's the guy at the very top of the org chart. That guy gets impatient again. That guy sees a shiny little toy over there that's like a superstar baby, not quite worth what you're giving up in a trade. Like, you start to worry a little bit. Ian, what's going on? My question is about the Knicks defensively under Tom Thibodeau. This is a guy that has the reputation of being a really strong defensive-minded coach. Not so much in Minnesota. They struggled with Towns at the pivot there. What can we expect for the Knicks, and can Thibodeau really invigorate this core to be a decent defensive team? Because really, that's all we're asking for is just decent. Matt, I'm not sure if Thibodeau is going to adjust his defensive schemes, but I think it starts with something as simple as setting a high standard and holding players accountable to that standard. We saw that last year with Kevin Knox when his playing time fluctuated based in part on how he was doing on the defensive end. I think you will see that to an even greater degree. And Thibodeau has shown an ability to get the best out of the player that already has shown a proclivity to be able to defend. And I think the Knicks have a few young players that fit that description in Mitchell Robinson, RJ Barrett, and Frank Nilakina. You look at this roster, I think there's gonna be roster turnover. Is there a player that stands out to you where you say, hey, this player under Thibodeau can really make a leap forward? To me, the most interesting one is Robinson because Tibbs and all his journeys from Boston to Chicago, to Minnesota, has never had a big man who athletically can do what that guy can do. Not even KG at the time Boston had him. Was a seven footer who could jump out of the gym. Now he fouls a lot, he's gonna make mistakes, young player mistakes, the fundamentals are coming along, but like, that dude makes a difference when he's on the court. You know, that kind of player is kind of going out of style in the NBA, right? Like just dive and dunk, no shooting range. Although he shoots in practice, we all see that. Um, But that player can still 
win you a lot of regular season games. Zach, you recently wrote uh, for ESPN.com on your two all-rookie teams. Notably, R.J. Barrett was missing from the first team and the second team. You look at the names that I had, a lot of them put up numbers essentially equivalent to R.J. Barrett. Um, We're on better teams. And I'm just going off the top of my head, I don't remember the specifics. He's like, out of 35 rookies, he's like 28th in true shooting percentage, 29th in whatever advanced stat you want. 43% 43% on twos. I mean, just like, think about that for a second. You want to focus on the three-point shooting. 31%, I think. That's actually kind of encouraging. 43% on twos and 61% at the line. Like, that is really hurting your team. Doesn't mean I don't like him as a player going forward. I just don't think he had a particularly compelling kid. You know, before Leon Rose took over, and I think it's still the case, one of the things the Knicks were thinking about was, hey, Let's get a big guy who can stretch the floor. I think part of the thinking there was for R.J. Barrett to help him out. And the other thing was, let's get a lead guard who can shoot. I think that was to make Robinson more effective in the pick and roll and to spread the floor a little bit for Barrett. So I think some people over there at least are thinking uh, along the same line. Yo, bags. I feel like I've been on World Wide West my whole life. He's graced the lips of artists like Jay-Z and Drake. He's been ingrained in basketball culture for years. So he's still my second favorite worldwide, but I am ready to see him take over the world, which means that they gotta get it done on the court. Aside from rap lyrics, what's World Wide West all about? So William Wesley is a connector. That's the phrase that's used most often. He's got these relationships with uh, some of the top players in basketball, developed when these players were younger, even in high school. A lot of players referred to him as Uncle Wes. Wes was gonna work with the Knicks, uh, whether officially or unofficially, because he has such a close business relationship and friendship with Knicks president, Leon Rose. You know, Wes helps them procure top talent and gives them a credibility with players around the league that they have lacked in recent years. You know Knicks fans, you're in New York. You know how passionate they are. You know how miserable they've been. Are there reasons for optimism? People introduced themselves to me. The first thing I asked them was, who's your team? And since I'm in the New York area, 50% minimum are Knicks fans. And they always like preface it by saying like, ah, you know, the Knicks. (laughs) And I just, I tell them all the same thing. Like, it's going to happen. At some point, it's going to happen. The Knicks are not going to be bad forever. At some point, a superstar free agent is going to come here. At some point, they are going to win the lottery. They are still New York. It's still a place that players want to go. It's still the most hallowed ground to play basketball in the NBA. It's going to happen. Now, they have not put themselves in the best position to make it happen anytime soon, but like, It will happen. They're not going to be bad forever. Zach, this was great. Thanks so much for joining us, man. I'm Ian. That's Maurice. We will see you guys next week on The Putback.